Good afternoon and welcome to um, <clears throat> the College Lecturers Day business webinar. Um, today I'm, I'm hosting, <clears throat> it's Tess Howe from the skills team uh, from BIS um, and I am the senior skills manager so I look after all of our levy payers and look at the, the business and the people management skills that we need uh, moving forward. So this afternoon um, we've got three presentations for you following a very similar format to the other webinars that you've probably all signed into. Um, we have Mark Campbell, David Swales and Derek Cardis all talking to you about very different elements um, that all contribute to the way that businesses, um, we, we're going to support the business going forward um, across the agriculture sector. Really, we're, this afternoon is about introducing the different elements of work that we've all been working on, the research and how we think um, industry is going to play out over the next few years and how we can then support them moving forward. So just a little bit of housekeeping for you um, to get started. I'm sure you're all up to date on this completely now. So as an attendee, you're muted. Um, any questions, please just tap those into the question box. They'll pop up on my screen and then at an appropriate moment, I will read those out to the person presenting. We're going to have um, a presentation, then a question section and then presentation and question sent, um, question session again. Um, so just answer those, ask those questions as and when they pop into your head and we will um, answer them as appropriate. If there is any unanswered questions, don't feel we're ignoring you. It might be that the answer's coming up further on in the presentation, or it might be that we're really short on time. We've, we've, we've all got limited time this afternoon. So we will post all of those in an FAQ if there's any unanswered questions, so you will get answers in some way or another. Um, we're hoping to finish about 3.30. Appreciate you're all busy and you'll all have other things to do. So we'll try our best not to go past that time frame. Um, and we will be doing, um, you'll get an email at the end of the session with a, a, a handout and, and signposting you into um, any of the information that you've heard today. So if there's anything afterwards that you want to get in touch or you want a recording of the webinar, that will all come to you in the next few days as well. So without further delay, I'm going to move us on to our first presentation, which is Derek, and he's talking about planning. Derek. Hello, everyone. Hello, Tess. Yeah, I'm actually going to talk about performance. So uh, that's the place I'm going to start. Good afternoon, everyone. I head up the farm economics team for AHDB, the team that uh, works with growers and farmers across the sectors looking at business performance. And that's the area that we're going to focus on today. So uh, we're on the we're on the first slide. Good stuff. So in terms of what we're trying to do, we're trying to set the scene. Uh, we did a piece of work a few years ago with a group of attendees at a monitor farm event uh, over in east anglia and very informally we just asked those to indicate whether they were involved in any performance assessments for their business or active cost planning uh, and as you can see from the screen only 28 percent admitted that they were proactively involved in that type of activity now, admittedly, that was six years ago, but we have little evidence that anything has changed in terms of farmer attitudes towards this area. Next slide, please, Tess. So, meanwhile, moving on from 2014, we come to 2016 and the Brexit referendum came and went. And as a result of the decision off the back of that referendum, AHDB produced a series of uh, very insightful horizon reports and they were quite wide ranging and they looked at the impacts of Brexit on international trade, uh, competing on the world stage, um, the potential new regulatory framework for UK farmers post Brexit and importantly for the area that I want to talk about today, um, a, a very useful report on productivity and the areas that are within each farmer's control in order for them to make changes to set their business up to succeed in whatever the uh, post-Brexit world looks like. Next slide, please, Tess. This report, uh, oh, I think you've gone on uh, two there. Can we go back one? Well, no, 
we've got one missing. Okay, I'll talk anyway uh, about this one. So the Horizon report that we uh, are particularly talking about is the characteristics of top performing farms. And this was a piece of uh, work that was done a couple of years ago now, and it looked at the range of performance evident in the UK um, in terms of farm businesses. It looked at uh, the top performing farms, uh, mid performing farms and bottom performing farms. And the, the good piece that came out of this research is that regardless of the um, headwinds that face farm businesses post Brexit, the top performing farms will always remain profitable. So the next step for this piece of work was to identify what it was about the top performing farms and the top 25% in particular uh, that puts them in that bracket. What do they do? What techniques do they employ? Um, and as, as a result of that, we came out with eight key factors um, that really dictate what it is that the best do that the others don't. And for us in this performance field, the most relevant ones there are minimizing overhead costs, setting goals and budgets, comparing with others and gathering information, focusing on detail and having a mindset for change and innovation. So when we take this forwards, um, the key thing for us is to provide farmers with the means and the resources and the support to try to move forwards on uh, their own businesses in regard to these factors. So what we uh, the principle that we uh, are working to on this is this one that's highlighted quite neatly in this little um, diagram on the screen now. Uh, and it's a fairly simple cycle that I'm sure most of you will be familiar with. Um, it's referred to in a number of different ways. It's the principle of continuous improvement. Uh, some call it the plan, do, check, act concept. But in, in effect, in its most basic form in this area, what we want farmers to do is to understand how their business performs today in all respects. Then, as a reference point, understand how the best businesses are performing and they need to be comparable businesses and doing similar things to, to the, the, the target business that we're looking at. And then understand where the points of difference are between those two things. And once the farmer has identified where the key differences are, we want to be able to support them to implement change so that they can move closer towards the performance of those good and, and top 25% businesses. So in detail then, the first of the objectives that we've put together uh, in this area is um, to work primarily with those businesses uh, who might be regarded as being more traditional in outlook. Uh, and those businesses that don't routinely use data to manage their farm at the moment. This is the entry level point in particular. And what we want to do here is to provide tools and resources to allow those businesses to understand uh, their performance at a whole farm level initially, uh, using data that's easily and readily available, uh, and then start to look at taking farmers down the route of the component parts of the business or enterprises but only at a very headline level. Um, this whole area of work is predicated on easily accessible data points uh, and uh, a quick and simple assessment uh, of performance. And on the screen here, you can see a, a quick snapshot of our new um, KPI tool that was recently released. And this is a particular KPI on here as an example in relation to a, a physical or a technical measure that's based on data that all sheep farmers will have readily available to them. And in just in a matter of a couple of minutes, put in a couple of simple numbers and the system will return your result as a farmer in relation to above average, below average, good or excellent. And you can see very quickly how you um, how you compare. The important thing then, once you understand how you compare, is that if you are 
in a band where you're not particularly content with your performance. Uh, there are clear signposts on the right hand side here for moving on to other resources or um, tools or uh, reports which might help you to make changes um, to your business that will help you improve that particular KPI. Next slide please Tess. So what we, what we do uh, at a second level, so this is the second tier, is to take producers uh, further down the route of looking at the performance of their business and this one very much is focused on looking at the component enterprises which make up a whole farm. Uh, one of the main tools that we have available at this level is FarmBench which might be a tool that some of you are familiar with. It's AHDB's flagship tool in this area that's been available to industry for the last two years or so and its primary objective is to provide a platform for farmers to plug in relevant data to allow them to calculate a cost of production for each of the product, products that uh, they're producing and then to compare that at a detailed level to see how that compares to again to the top 25% uh, mid performance and, and the bottom 25%. Um, Again, the key thing with this is that uh, this is a, a second tier um, tool. That's how we regard it. Uh, this won't necessarily be a tool for those farmers who've never engaged in this type of thing before. So we see this as a tool that farmers who've used the KPI tool will potentially move on to in subsequent years. It requires quite an in, uh, quite an in-depth level of data, uh, both at a technical and at a financial level. And for a mixed farm, it will it will easily be half a day or a day's work to plug in all of the data that's required to do this. But for those businesses that are mixed uh, and that have a very uh, complex nature, this is quite an important task to do. And if it's not done elsewhere, then we think it's worth the time invested uh, once a year to go through this process. Um, and it fulfills a key requirement identified in the uh, in the reports that we referred to earlier, the characteristics of the top 25%, because uh, the single most important thing that farmers can do is to understand uh, and quantify and then minimise overhead costs. And of course, that's a quite a complex thing to do on a mixed farm. And we've all heard comments from farmers about allocation of fixed costs, it's too difficult or it's complete guesswork and it's not worth the effort and so on. But to go through that process and understand which enterprises are consuming which overheads is a very important thing to do in order to calculate an accurate cost of production uh, and on then, of course, in order to compare that to uh, the benchmarks. Uh, final slide, please, Tess. So the, the final area, and again, this moves us on uh, to the next tier, is to work with the businesses that are already identified as being in the top 25% and supporting them to drive their business efficiency further. Um, and there's a number of ways here for those businesses to do that. Um, one of those ways would be to understand how your business compares to key competitor businesses uh, or industries overseas, uh, particularly those who are operating in the same global marketplace. Uh, and this is particularly important for those commodities such as cereals or, or beef, um, but also possibly lamb, depending on what terms the UK uh, ends up trading post-Brexit. Um, we are also seeking with this area of work to um, support farmers, particularly in some sectors such as horticulture, to move further towards automation. Um, particularly where sourcing the relevant labour at the right time and at the right price and so on, uh, where that can be such a difficult thing. Uh, and again, a bit of an unknown post-Brexit. Uh, but another key part of some of the work in this area, of course, is, is lean, which I'm sure is a concept that, uh, that some of you will be familiar with. And two particular projects that, um, that will fall under this objective uh, will be the Smart Hort project, which is where we've got a number of smart hort centres set up across the country, uh, which are demonstration centres for other horticulture growers to see how lean techniques can be implemented and how they work in practice. Um, 
and can provide uh, useful uh, alternative methodologies to driving efficiency through businesses and a boost in productivity. The same sort of methodology applies to the even newer area of work, which is smart pork. Uh, and we are currently in the process of setting up a network of uh, smart pork monitor farms, which again will do the same thing and adopt the same approach to uh, looking at lean techniques, seeing how they might work in practice uh, on pig farms and how they can be used to drive improvements in performance through marginal gains and through the process of continuous improvements that we uh, referred to earlier. So overall, this, this tiered approach will hopefully cater for the majority of, of farm businesses across the sectors uh, and those and the majority of people uh, in terms of business managers, uh, in terms of their current approach to business and whether they are new to using data as a means of assessing performance and driving performance or whether they're old hands at it and uh, are looking for the next thing. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you, Tess. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Derek. We've got a couple of questions for you, so you, you don't get off camera just yet. Um, <clears throat> the farm bench data, is that from the Rural Business Unit and their registered farms, or is it AHDB data? Good question. Yeah, it's, it's, there's no connection between it and uh, the Farm Business Survey or the Rural Business Unit. Uh, it is solely data that other farm bench users have put into the system <clears throat> themselves. So we gather data or rather users, farmers input their own data into the system. We work with them to check it for completeness and accuracy uh, and then we go through the a process of approval. So once we're happy and the farmer is happy that the data is complete and robust, we'll approve it. It then becomes anonymized and that builds up across the industry to an anonymized and aggregated data set that others can compare to. And are you able to share with us how many farms are registering that data at the moment? Uh, yes, certainly. So since we launched FarmBench at the beginning of 2019, we've had over two and a half thousand uh, registered farmers uh, use the system. Uh, that varies across the sectors. We, we went to, uh, uh, off to a very quick start in, in the arable sectors. So the majority of those users at this stage have arable crops, uh, but beef and lamb are catching up now. Uh, that's the, the next sector that uh, is moving forward quite nicely. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so, some good numbers across uh, the programme in the first two years. But the key thing is with, with um, uh, the number of farm businesses across the UK in the hundreds of thousands, we need to be doing far more of this type of thing. So we've got a, a challenge on our hands to engage far more producers in this type of activity. And that would take <clears throat> take me on to a point I was thinking about, Derek. Is there a way that the college lecturers can actually use this um, with their students? So is, is there a way of putting in a, a test farm or have we already got that data where they could then set assignments about establishing cost of production? Because as you've mentioned, that really is one of the key components of a top performing farm and a, and a behaviour that we really need to instil in, in the industry. Yeah, good question. Yes, we, we can do all of that. Uh, and yes, we do work with some uh, some colleges on this specifically. So uh, we've got a regional team uh, of staff who work with farmers principally, but also with, with some colleges uh, regionally on giving uh, lectures or demonstrations of the system to groups of students and working with them to set pieces of, of coursework potentially on on how you can monitor a farm business performance through this this type of activity. So, so yes, we do do some of that at the moment, and we're always open to approaches to do more if people think that would be of benefit. And I think Derek, one of the things we've talked about in the past, and I don't know how far we've managed to move forward with it with different priorities, but um, college farms of cannot have different cost of production because they're a college farm rather than a commercial farm and and there's been some talk about could we set up a group for college farms to to look at each other and what as we do with other consultants is that something that we could progress or we have already yeah. started uh, we, we, we've not started it at the moment, but yes, it's certainly something we can progress. And, and from my own experience, I, I know exactly what uh, what that can look like. I, I was formerly one of those regional people working on the ground 
uh, supporting uh, farmers to enter their data. And yeah, I, over the years, I worked with a number of college farms and university farms in this area and understand the complexities involved and, and some of the other pressures on them, which aren't always or, or rarely uh, are actually commercial pressures. So, um, so yeah, I think that would be a very sensible thing to, so to, to compare a, a college farm to, uh, to, to just your everyday commercial farm is, is not a like for like comparison. So there would certainly be uh, plenty of merit in an exercise uh, looking at a group of college farms as an entity and looking how one performs against another yeah that's great so if anybody's listening and they and they want to take part in that then please do get in touch with us um it's something we can only do if we get your input so um feel a bit free to drop it into the feedback if that's something you want to progress with and we can follow that up with you and um, everything that comes in we can see who's asking and, and how we get in touch so um we we'll, we'll can get in touch with you individually afterwards um a couple more questions are the farmers um that are engaged they happy to share the data register for these programs or is it just the better farmers that that know they're doing well that are registering with you uh yeah typically farmers are more than happy to to share their data um albeit it's it's a relatively low proportion of industry at the moment as as we've already referred to there are some questions about data visibility um and who else has access to the data, but that is very closely controlled. And uh, once we've spoken to farmers and assured them of how we manage the data and who has access to it, um, they're pretty relaxed about entering their data into, into these systems. Um, one of the key ways that farmers use uh, FarmBench is uh, within the discussion group format. So uh, that's a format where you'll have uh, eight, 10, 12 farmers who are, all have something in common. Uh, they might all be in a certain geographical area or producing the same crop or the same type of livestock and, and they will collectively put their own data in and then uh, come together in a, in a group and, and share their identity and which data set is theirs and, and learn from each other in terms of who's doing what. Um, on the point about whether it's just the best farmers that use it, this, this is a question that comes up quite a lot and you would you would naturally expect uh, that it may be the sort of the better end of the industry or the better performing end of the industry that would lean towards using something like this. But in our experience, when you when you actually look at the data that's entered, uh, there's such a huge range in performance uh, that we don't think that that's actually the case. Uh, and as an example, um, from our uh, one of our uh, past sets of dairy data, we we've had costs of production ranging from 17 pence a litre to 65 pence a litre, which I think clearly shows you that uh, that it's not just the best businesses that we're using that tool. And, and again, more recently, from uh, an arable perspective, we've had costs of production for potatoes from sort of 130 pounds a tonne up to over 500 pounds a tonne. So there's a huge range in performance across the uh, across the user base for farm bench. That's brilliant. And we've talked about comparing like for like and, and trying to keep those productions similar, um, similar when we're comparing them. But do we ever extend those comparisons out to other countries around the world? And, and how do we stack up if we do do that? Yes, we do. And that's uh, that's one of the areas of work that's covered by the reference on the slide, I think, that you can still see on the screen to uh, Agri Benchmark. So AHDB is uh, a member of the International Agri Benchmark Network, and that allows us to contribute uh, GB data into the network and have access to data from countries all around the world across the sectors so we can see how GB farms are performing. And uh, that's a really useful thing, and I think we'll, it will gain in, in interest and use as we move beyond Brexit and, and uh, whatever the international trading arrangements look like uh, from January onwards. Um, the UK producers are going to have to compete potentially with uh, producers in quite a few countries around the world. And having insights into how a typical farm, a uh, typical dairy farm in Ireland, for example, right on our doorstep, is able to produce milk and at what price compared to GB farmers uh, and for 
uh, beef producers comparing in, in, in GB to what the South Americans can do. Um, it's an it's important thing. Um, all of these things are going to be uh, traded potentially at, uh, at a commodity level and UK producers without subsidy are going to be um, uh, subject to, to those market forces more than ever going forward. So having those insights, I think, is quite an important thing, particularly for the, for the best producers who are seeking to compete with the best overseas. And I think that probably highlights why you've got that tiered system, um, Derek, of people just being able to do a light touch and look at some figures, but actually then going on to finding out we know what our figures are and where we we might be failing or doing it as well, and and as sending on to that different that extra work for them to then resolve the problem. Yeah, absolutely. The the, the mixture of businesses across the country is is massive uh, in terms of their scale, in terms of their capability, uh, and in terms of their performance. And there are an awful lot. The vast majority of of farm businesses just do not engage in this type of active uh, data usage and, and, and monitoring. And it's important that uh, as we drive this forwards over the next few years, that we are able to provide something for every type of business at each level. So that regardless of the skill set or the current performance of the business, there's a point that they can come in, start in this area, and then move through as they become more interested in it can see the benefits of uh, engaging in this type of work uh, and what it can deliver. Brilliant. And just to wrap it up, I've got one last question. I'm going to put you on the spot, Derek. Um, is there three three things or one to three things that you would ask the lecturers to really think about when they're delivering the curriculum that would really help farmers in this area and the, the, the future farmers to, to take the most of this? What would you advise that they're really focusing on? Oh, uh, I think for me, um, it's striking the right benefit between technical and business when it comes to training future farmers. Um, and I think things uh, have moved quite a long way from 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 the days when uh, when I was at college um, 25 years ago. And uh, from memory, there wasn't a huge amount uh, in in the business um, side of the uh, curriculum at that point. Um, but I'm sure since then things have moved on hugely. And I would like to think that uh, if there's if there's one message that students would take away from um, their time at college or university looking at agriculture, is that first and foremost uh, they're business managers and that going forwards they're going to need to uh, be responsible for uh, businesses surviving in a in a cut and thrust marketplace which predecessor business managers haven't had to do so i think that would be my number one um i think i think i'll leave it there okay that's brilliant and, and thank you very much and um, so that was derek carlos our head of farm economics and it's really great to hear that he's got a team out there working with the farmers and collecting the real data so that when you do delve into these systems and tools and, and make use of them, you can be confident that they're really showing the picture of um, UK agriculture as it is for those that are engaging with us at the moment. Um, so we're going to move on to the next section now, which is um, David Swales. And David is the, um, the head of strategic insights. So he's part of our market intelligence uh, team. David, would you like to um, switch your camera on and join us? I hope it is on, Tess, but yeah, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so as uh, Tess said, um, I work within our market intelligence team at AHDB. Uh, so I mean, a lot of my work in the last couple of years has been focused on Brexit and some of the big issues there, how they're going to affect the industry and, and kind of focusing increasingly on of what we think farmers need to do to sort of prepare for these changes coming uh, coming uh, down the train. So I'm going to talk today uh, a little bit about the planning area. Uh, and, and this is quite a, at an early stage, really. So we have started to do some work to plan out what work we're already doing uh, against this, this broad theme, uh, but also what new things do we want to start doing as an organisation over the next few years. Uh, so today I'm really going to talk a bit about the rationale to the programme, so what it is we want to do about planning and, and why is that important. 
Uh, and secondly, I'm going to focus uh, on some of our aims for, the, for this area uh, and a few examples of the work we want to undertake. Uh, so yeah, I thought uh, you guys probably thought you were in for an easy, easy ride today. Uh, and my starting point isn't uh, really deep academic theory, unfortunately. I'm starting with the A team uh, just to set the uh, set the rationale for, for this program. So if you're too young to remember the A team, you need to get on YouTube immediately uh, and get a bit of a reference point for this. But this this was a 1980s uh, program. And I think the really remarkable thing about the A-Team is there were 98 episodes and pretty much every episode had the same plot in again and again and again. Uh, and there was the same predictable outcome to pretty much every episode. Uh, so for me, um, uh, you know I mean? basically the basic uh, episode of, of the A-Team involved um, the team being locked in a warehouse of some form. Hannibal, who was the, the brains of the operation, he's, he's the chap at the front, he had to devise uh, a plan uh, to sort of deal with the situation. And that plan usually involved um, the team fashioning weapons out of everyday household items. Uh, and then there would be a, a, an almighty end battle where there'd be bullets flying around, explosions everywhere, and uh, nobody would ever get killed, nobody would ever be injured, uh, but they would always win at the end. Uh, uh, now, my, my point of sharing this with you is really that planning, I think, is really easy when you're planning for the same thing over and over and over again, uh, and everything is very predictable. So planning is easy when the world is constant. Uh, but I think the challenge farmers have is, is the world isn't constant for farmers, and there's, there's lots of change on the horizon. If we can move to the next slide, please, Tess. So yeah, when we look forward over the next uh, few years, we do at HDB see an awful lot of change coming uh, about, which is gonna have a profound impact on the farming industry. Uh, so starting with um, evolving consumer demands. Uh, so shoppers' expectations are constantly changing at the minute. Uh, there's a lot of concern about the environment. There's a lot of ethical considerations which consumers are thinking of. And we've also seen quite a profound impact of, of COVID on, on what we buy and how we shop. Uh, and also potentially we're gonna be heading into a, a massive recession, which will also have a, a, a direct bearing on, on shoppers' behavior. Um, also of importance is, is moving towards net zero. So farmers are increasingly aware of their environmental impact. And there's things which we will need to do differently as an industry to reduce that impact and, and move towards net zero over the next um, uh, 20 or 30 years. Uh, new technologies will no doubt be key to that. So there's things like use of data, robotics, um, artificial technology, new production technologies, a whole range of change going on, uh, which potentially provides a range of opportunities for, for farmers. Uh, and the final area is really about um, trade policy and agricultural policy. So we are leaving uh, the EU or we have left the EU uh, and we're currently in the process of negotiating trade deals, both with the EU and with other parties around the world. Uh, and that's going to have quite a profound impact in the, on the competitive environment in which our, our industries have to operate. Uh, now, I think one of our really key messages uh, to the industry is that it's quite dangerous really to have a, a wait and see approach to all of this. So we are conscious that some levy payers, uh, they may be out there, they may wait for things to change and then react to them. Uh, and I think our basic point is that's quite high risk and it's really important for levy payers to be monitoring what's going on uh, in, in all these areas uh, and building a bit of a forward plan in terms of what they want to do. Uh, and at HDB, we want to help them with that. So, uh, so a core part of our, our planning work stream really is to monitor these sorts of changes and give our levy payers information on them of, of what these changes might mean for them, if we could move on a slide. So focusing on perhaps the biggest uh, and most substantive of those changes, I think agricultural policy really is a, is a key one uh, for me. Uh, and when I look at the change which is going to occur there over the next seven or so years, um, we think at HDB that really does require quite a lot of our, our effort and support to help our levy payers deal with this change. So many of you will be aware of this already. Uh, but yeah, in essence, in England, we do know now that the government is going to move away from the current system of direct payments. 
So there's a plan to do this over a, a seven year horizon. Uh, and the, the next set of payments will be the first where there is a, a reduction. Uh, and, and that reduction varies dependent on the, the level of payments the farmers are currently getting. Uh, so you can see there, Joanne, it might be as low as 5% in the first year, all the way up to potentially 25% of the payment for those receiving the, the highest payment levels. Um, and, and that's a really profound shift for farmers. I think a lot of farms have been dependent on this support. Uh, and what they're going to have to get used to is a new agricultural policy system where rather than receiving direct payments uh, for, for farming, increasingly they, they will receive public money uh, for, for delivering specific public goods. So there's talk of things like the uh, ELM scheme and other environmental schemes which, which might be available. And we expect that they won't be quite as generous as the systems of support we've had available in the past. If we move on a slide, um, this to me really does demonstrate how key uh, direct payments are for, for some sectors of agriculture and it, and it is a variable piece. So you can see here the first column is probably the, the key one to focus on. Uh, this is data from DEFRA's farm business survey and it shows the sort of um, levels of farm business income across different sectors. So the all farm average there on the far left hand side is around about £37,000 of, of profit or net, uh, net farm business income um, each year. And you can see the average across all the industry is about 61% of, of that 37,000 is made up of direct payments. So they are really critical across the whole in industry. But if you look at the other bars there, you can see how that does vary significantly by different sector. Uh, so we can see particularly the, the grazing livestock farms, the, the LFA, the less favoured area, and the lowland grazing livestock farms are particularly dependent on these support payments. Uh, much, much more so than, say, the pig sector or horticulture, which have, have really low levels. So this is really important information. and we, we think the sort of need for the business programme um, is going to be very much focused on those sectors with the, with the higher levels of dependency on direct payments. So the cereal sector and the grazing livestock sectors are two areas where we're, we're very much keen to focus on. And we think there's going to be the greatest need for this type of information. Um, and as you can see here, um, levels of planning activity and, and uptake of, of these sort of business practices does vary um, or, or is relatively low, I think, across the industry as a whole. So the, the middle bars there are just, just over 50% or so of farms um, have an informal type of business plan uh, and, and just below 20% have a formal business plan. Uh, this is quite old data now, so this is something DEFRA look at very occasionally in their farm business survey. But you can see here, there's lots of farms that actually don't do any of these practices. Um, and there is a very clear link uh, between the farms who do these types of activities and those which are the most profitable uh, 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 in their operations. So there's certainly uh, some, some evidence that these types of things help uh, a, a farm be profitable. Uh, when we look at our, our report about the high performing farms, Derek has, has kind of uh, alluded to that in his presentation about that research we did to understand what it was that made those farms high performing. A number of our characteristics actually do relate to planning type practices. So there's things in there such as setting goals and budgets, comparing yourselves with others and gathering information and understanding the market you're operating in. So these are all really key areas which we want to help and, and support our levy payers uh, with uh, as part of this, this, this area of the programme. Um, so yes, yeah, certainly we can conclude that, that these practices are widespread in their uptake across the industry as a whole. Uh, and as well as varying by sector, um, we do recognise that this does vary by the sort of characteristics of, of the farmer themselves and, and, and their sorts of um, uh, their behaviours and their attitudes. Uh, so we do various pieces of work at HDB to sort of understand how we roll things out and how they may be perceived by our levy payers. Uh, and this is just an example of some segmentation work which, we're, which we've used. Uh, and you can see here across these different farm uh, segments, there's going to be sort of different levels of use of these types of planning tools. So at you know, the, the, the top row there, the more progressive farmers, they probably already have a very clear business plan. They have a clear vision. They set goals. They measure things. They have a budget. 
So actually, some of the support we're providing here is probably stuff which those farmers are already doing. Uh, and all we really have to do is maybe supply them with some supporting information and they're able to take that on board and action it and, and, and use it within their business setting. Uh, but some of those other segments on the list that they may be less, uh, less willing or less able to, to, to do this type of work and really plan and, and take measures in advance. So what we're trying to do really is to target some of these. So particularly the defender segment and the operator segment who join these traditionally, maybe, yeah, they're more traditional farms. They probably don't really do that much budgeting or planning unless they kind of have to as part of an engagement with their bank manager. Uh, and what we think is going to be increasingly important as that level of direct payment comes down, these these farms are going to be more exposed to some of these business pr uh, pressures that they've had in the past and they're going to have to change if they're going to survive so really providing some support and some assistance to them we think is going to be really critical for the, the future profitability uh, of the industry if we move forward please tess great so really just to set the, the the framework then in terms of what we're aiming to do is our aim for this this workshop is really for farmers and growers to have a, a viable strategy and a plan which allows them to meet their personal and business goals so this isn't a one-size-fits-all approach I mean, we recognize that different farmers will want different things from their business I and mean, they won't all be focused on maximizing their profits some of them will have other goals and objectives which they want to fulfill and what we want farmers to do really is take a step back uh, every so often and have that look at, uh, of their farm from a business perspective and understand are they sort of delivering and is it set up how it should be to, to de deliver for them. So we want to help them improve their levels of forward planning. We want them to budget. We want to raise awareness of risk management and also succession within their businesses so they can adapt to that changing environment and build a more resilient uh, business model. Uh, so HDB, uh, we already provide quite a few tools and resources in this in this area, but we want to really ramp that up quite significantly. Uh, and, and make really good use of both our direct touch points with our levy payers. So that might be events and webinars and discussion groups and, and, and monitor farms, things like that to help pull this information through. Uh, but also uh, there's lots of farmers out there who deal with lots of trusted advisors, people like banks and accountants and consultants. So we want to increasingly work with partners in the industry um, who, who want to help us get that information out to our levy payers uh, and provide that support to their clients. And, and so it's part of this is working through those types of bodies uh, and organisations as well. Uh, so I thought I'd end just by giving you a, a bit of an example. Uh, and it's difficult because you know, we obviously do lots of work in this area uh, already. Uh, but yeah, I wanted to give you a few examples of some of the work we're doing and, and, and how, how this relates to the area. So the first one is really around Brexit. So I think on day one uh, of, of the, the webinar, you had a presentation from, from Sarah Baker focusing on Brexit and what that might mean for the industry. So our approach with Brexit really is to, to monitor what's going on, to analyse what's happening and then try to provide our farmers with really detailed information around what that means for them. So Joanne, it's fine knowing what's on the news, but what does that specifically mean for their farm businesses? So part of our market intelligence offer is to put that information out to our levy payers. And increasingly, we want to put alongside that a, a range of tools and resources. So if farmers can understand what it means, they're then signposted to relevant information to help them adapt their business and make changes. So some examples are here, things like our Brexit impact calculator, our resilience checklist and our Brexit toolkit. So the Brexit impact calculator is a really good example of a tool where the farmer can put in information about their specific farm and then see how Brexit would affect them. Uh, so they get almost like a, a what if type tool to understand how the situation might change. And if they find out as a result of that, they're suddenly less profitable or they have specific challenges in their business, we can then signpost them to relevant tools uh, such as FarmBench, for example, or the KPI tool Derek spoke about earlier, so they can actually make some changes on their, on their business. Um, the other area I was gonna highlight is something we call the Agri-Market Outlook. Uh, so we've always offered a, a market intelligence service at HDB and we, we we're always monitoring prices in the marketplace and understanding what's going on uh, in the markets and providing levy pays with that information. 
Uh, but going forward, what we're aiming to do is to provide much more sort of foresight type information to give them a, a bit of a horizon scanning um, uh, assessment on things which are going to change. So rather than just telling levy payers what the price is now, we want to give them the information around what's affecting that price and how is it likely to change in the future. So the Agri-Market Outlook, which we, we published on our website in July, is a good example of that. And we've split, split that information down by different sectors so farmers can access that information and get an understanding of how prices are going to change. So hopefully that information can be used by farmers when they're doing their forward planning and they're doing their budgeting. So rather than using what the, the price is on a specific day, uh, when the price can be quite volatile, maybe they'll use that information to come up with a, a view about what the price will be uh, going forward. Uh, so those are just a couple of examples. Uh, we may have time under questions to, to touch on a few more, but yeah, today I've just hopefully given you a bit of an overview about what this type, what this piece of the program was all about. Thank you. That's really useful, David. Thank you, and, and a vast amount of information. You've you've mentioned various different tools that are available for the levy payer. How many of those would be applicable and available to the college lecturers for them to use um, as sort of training in in, in college? Uh, yeah, no, good question, Tess. I think uh, our basic approach at HDB is to make all of our resources and information freely available. Uh, so, Joe and I obviously refer to levy payers because I'm, I'm used to talking uh, to, to levy payers. But yeah, if a college lecturer wanted to access that information and material, it's all there on, on the website. Our contact details are all on the website. So, Joe, we're happy to talk to, to college lecturers and provide you guys with, with information uh, because obviously the next generation of our levy payers are being supported by you. So, we want them to be aware of these tools and these resources. So, hopefully, when they move into the industry, they can make full use of them. And you mentioned um, uh, briefly in one of your slides about um, the improving the level of forward planning for farmers. And obviously we don't know what the future holds, but we can. there's certain things that we can mitigate and plan for. You mentioned three things, budgeting, risk management and succession. Would, would you put any of those in any particular order and, and explain which order? Oh. Well, I, I think they're probably all important and it probably depends uh, by the, the, the farm business, which aspects are most important to them and, and, and their specific situation. So I think our aim of, of, of providing information and resources and tools is, is to almost have a bit of a pick and mix approach so uh, people can access the things which, which are most useful to their situation. Uh, but yeah, but certainly, uh, John, in, Forward planning, I think, is really key and, and perhaps a, a bit of a building block. So John, we've come across this a lot with some of the Brexit work we've done and we've surveyed um, lots of our levy payers and asked them questions around John, what steps they've taken to prepare for Brexit and, uh, and, and what changes they've made to their business. And what we found in that work is, is John, I mean, a, a, a high proportion of the industry, certainly over 50 percent of, of the industry, hadn't really done anything at all. Uh, they were kind of in, in a wait and see type mode. So it was very much waiting for all the changes to happen and then responding to them. And I think that's the basic thing which we, we want to try to, to correct. So John, I can fully understand why people would be confused with Brexit and EU exit and, and there's loads of uncertainty, but there are certain things which are gonna change come what may. Um, uh, the direct payment situation is, is one example of that. So there's certain things which people do need to do to start to prepare. So it's, it's probably similar to, uh, to, to Derek's um, area where we've probably got different levels of, of farming operation. And, and the most basic level is to start to do some, some basic forward planning. Maybe it, at the more advanced level is getting farmers to do risk management type approaches and, and succession planning. And do you, I mean, referring back to your slide about business planning and the, the numbers that are really quite shocking about how few people do it, do you, have you got an opinion on what the barriers are to that business planning? And is there something that colleges can, can start to look at to help people break down those barriers? Um, good question. Um, yeah, it's, I, it's a difficult one. I, I suspect um, the, the size of businesses is, is one factor. So, I mean, uh, if you look at, the levels of planning by size you'll see generally it's the larger businesses that that have a, a a formal plan so if a farm literally is one man and his dog 
um, you know I mean, the, to the benefit of putting all that information down in a, in a written plan may be diluted a little bit from, from have, having the information in, in your head because you don't have to share it with so many people. So I think the size of our, uh, our industry is, is one factor or the size of the businesses within it is one factor. Um, but for me, um, a really core me uh, key message here is, I mean, it's more than just being technically good at farming. There's lots of business aspects of farming as well. Uh, and I think what we want farmers to do is really take a, a step back. And, and I mean, I think sometimes some parts of the industry fall into the trap of kind of doing certain things because they've always done them. Uh, and that's probably not where we need to be. And increasingly, the world is going to change. Uh, there's going to be a lot of change to the environment our farmers operate in. There's going to be changes to the support they receive. So now I think is as as important time as any to have a fresh look at, uh, at their businesses and understand. Do you know I mean direct payments is a really good example? What does my business look like with direct payments taken out of it? Am I still going to be profitable in seven years time? Uh, and if not, what steps do I need to take in order to prepare for that? That's brilliant. And you mentioned that you've, you've got a few tools that you talked through, but there was probably a couple of others. You've got five minutes if you did want to mention a couple of those other tools from your last slide. OK, so, yeah, just a, just a few examples. And so the resilience checklist is is a tool we developed around uh, around Brexit. And, and that focuses on those areas of um, what we call those high char the characteristics of high performing farmers. So it's, it's almost like a bit of a checklist so a farmer can go in and score themselves out of five. So this is a very much a self-assessment for certain areas. So do you mean they could go in and score themselves for do you mean, uh, controlling their costs or benchmarking and, and various areas they score themselves in terms of how good they think they are. Uh, and what we can then do is point them to relevant tools which AHDB have. Do you mean Farm Bench would be an example of this, um, the KPI tool. So it basically almost acts as a way to, uh, to sort of provide a route through our website to, to relevant tools for the situation of the individual farmer. Um, I think we recognize there's an awful lot of information and there's an awful lot of tools on the HDB website. And sometimes it's, it's finding the right one, to, one for you, that's the challenge. Um, the, the Brexit impact calculator, we're about to launch actually what we're calling the business impact calculator at, at the end of this month. Um, the business impact calculator is really a tool to enable farmers to understand that that drop in direct payments. So literally they can put in details about the, the payments they receive at the, at the minute and it will give them a forward projection around what that means. So that may seem quite basic uh, to, to a college lecturer, but I mean, I think quite a lot of the farmers we have dealt with haven't quite got their head around the fact yet that this is going to disappear quite quickly. Uh, so the first year reduction might be quite modest, but as, as we go through, it will go down to zero over seven years. So that's a really core cool message we need to get out there. So alongside the calculator, we want to do quite a, a big campaign, really, just to raise awareness of that change uh, across the industry and get farmers to start to think about that. Uh, because you know, there's a lot of people out there who still perhaps maybe they know about it, but haven't quite really got the head around what it means to them. Uh, and that's a dangerous place to be in. We'd rather farmers were for, sort of forearmed and forewarned for, 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 for the changes which lie ahead. That's brilliant. And then one, one more question. What would you like to see colleges focusing on from your perspective? Um, yeah, I guess for me, there's lots of, in, in the market intelligence team at HDB, we're putting out lots of information on markets lots of stuff on prices, on, on trade deals, on agricultural policy. Uh, so I mean, my hope really is that um, going forward, uh, people in the industry, the, the sort of next generation, will periodically take some time to think about their farm business as a business and really take a step back from the day to day and really have a, have a look at how their business is operating, how it's performing. Uh, and have a bit of a plan uh, of what they're going to do and a bit of a vision about where they want to get to. Uh, uh, and I think sometimes we get caught up in our day to day and we're all very busy and, and we don't make time for that. So I guess that's that's one key thing. Um, and yeah, I guess 
is understanding um, what changes are going to happen uh, and John, and using that information to understand what that means for your business. Uh, and, and finally, I guess, John, and there's lots of people out there who, who are set up to help farmers and give them support and information. So John, HDB is one example. We've got lots of resources, lots of information out there. So yeah, it'd be great to encourage people to, to use some of the information that's there. I, I often think of us a bit like a gym and, and our levy payers don't get the full benefit of, of the levy they pay unless they occasionally come and, and use some of those tools and, and resources and information. That's brilliant. It's not an analogy I've heard before, but it's a really good one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, David, and appreciate Thanks, that. The work that the market intelligence um, team, there's no way that we can deliver that in, in 20 minutes. So please do log on to the website and have a look what's available there because there is there's masses and masses of information and it. It's there as complex or as easy as you want to access it and use it as well. So please do engage with that. So moving on to our final presentation, which when we talk about business within HDB, we've split it into three. So you've heard about um, the performance and you've heard about planning. And then there's also that third wheel, which is really, really important and it brings it all together. And that's the people element. So Mark is gonna run through what we're doing on people now. Mark is the knowledge exchange manager for AgriLeader, um, and that covers all of the six sectors now where you may have heard of AgriLeader in the past as a dairy initiative, but we've now made it into a cross-sector initiative. So Mark, would you like to start? Good afternoon all. Yeah, as Tess said, Mark Campbell from the, the Biz team, um, and AgriLeader is a differentiated offer uh, that we offer at AHDB uh, to our leading and our top, uh, top producers uh, now across all six sectors that complements uh, the sector specific technical delivery so so why people um if you click through the test slowly as people say companies are made of people you don't uh, build a business you uh, you you build people that then build the business and and our people are, are the most important or important asset so really people uh within this this work program um, are the, the link to successful business. You can't plan um, uh, a high performing business without people um, at, the, at the core of that. Next slide, please, Tess. So, so what's the current challenge? Let's click again. So, unfortunately, within uh, UK farming and growing, uh, there's been a tendency, uh, and this is a very generalization, that there's been a big focus on the technical element of the business how we can improve fertility rates, how we can uh, improve uh, soil structures or organic matter in soil structure. And there's been less of a focus uh, on people and developing uh, people uh, within, within the business. Um, and that's probably because farmers and growers enjoy and are, are proud and are very focused on, on, on the technical element. They love cows, they love, they love uh, growing crops uh, or whatever that may be. And actually the, the people element and managing people and developing people is quite a scary, frightening part. If we look at a lot of people that have progressed within the industry, the reason they've progressed is because they're te technically competent. I can remember in my career, I progressed through the ranks and suddenly then I had a team of 14 people to manage. I didn't have a clue in terms of how to get the best out of that team, but I could get the best out of the, the dairy herd that I was, that I was milking. So it's, it's, a, it's a real uh, challenging point that we're, we're in at the moment. Next slide, please. So, so what? Um, so why, why people? Um, and there's a couple of few snippets of evidence um, or extracts from the Eurostats report or the Collison, Collison report. The state things like 35% of our industry um, uh, have or are undertaking uh, business uh, development or, or leadership training. So that's a huge amount that, that aren't doing that skills uh, promoting the skills uh, to work in teams and embrace collaborative approaches to business uh, which combine the skills in the industry uh, and the knowledge base and working with government to to develop a step change in investment in education training and skills in the workforce we're not investing the time and the energy uh, into people uh, and to developing our people to then hopefully progress uh, the performance and the, the planning element next slide please Tess. So, uh, like Derek mentioned, uh, we uh, 
did a piece of work a, a few years ago now that identified um, what are the traits of a top performing farmer and grower. Um, and a huge amount of research went into finding and understanding out how uh, the best agriculture and horticultural uh, businesses were um, were performing and, and were there traits that that um, were seen within those type of people and businesses. Um, and I've just highlighted a few there, which we would have all, myself, David, uh, and Derek would have all touched on in terms of key key points. Um, but if we think about the people element, setting goals, uh, focusing on detail, having a mindset change to innovate, but continuously improving people were clearly seen uh, in the research uh, sample of base uh, of these high performing farmers. So these farmers and growers are actually investing in their people. Um, and it's actually the, the caveat of that or the result of that is that they are operating uh, in, in the top 25 percent. So we need to build on that research and we need to, to make uh, a bit of a focus into how we can develop our people and our workforce within, within the industry. So the people work stream, the third prong um, of the stool uh, that links uh, performance planning uh, and us. And what we're trying to aim to achieve within this, this element of the work is to develop uh, a growth and a business mindset where staff availability skills um, or management competence um, is not a factor to hinder productivity. We need to develop our people to ensure that we can be um, high performing as, 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 as we move forward. Next slide, please. So that, that we've split that down into sort of four, four key, key objectives. And the first objective is, is to kind of controversially professionalize the industry further and have a big owner uh, emphasis and onus in developing and encouraging owners and managers um, to realize that there is a need for continuous um, access to leadership and management skill sets uh, and that we address those gaps um, for both themselves uh, as the as the leaders uh, and the owners of those businesses but also their team members ensuring that uh, as the, the picture there of the geese that we're, we're aligned and that we're, we're following um, following the lead uh, to be able to develop those those businesses and leading from the front um, we sometimes will need some change in that formation to, to allow rest um, and allow others peoples to lead but to focus and to identify areas where um, the the industry is, is lacking uh, in those skills in those skill sets um, as an industry like I've said we're not we like to do the do in terms of the farming or the growing we don't like to do the nitty-gritty to to develop the people because it's not seen to be uh, have a direct impact on the bottom line or the success of the business which in hindsight um, it, it actually does next slide please Tess so the second area that we need to focus on um, is, is developing um, a real strong culture uh, for planning staff succession. So we're not talking here about your, your, your family succession planning within a business. We're talking about that workforce um, succession. So that individuals um, have the capability to develop this strategic leadership. And I've kind of um, put this in a, in a context um, of some engine parts. So currently in terms of the industry, we've got lots of component pieces, but potentially uh, they're not stored or structured in, in a hugely, um, ordered manner. What we need to move to is the more of a, uh, the, and this came from a German automotive uh, uh, company, that we need to be uh, aligned in a bit more of a planned, structured manner that we can identify uh, what skills we need at what time and how we can plan that in uh, to our workforce planning so that the business maintains continuity uh, uh, and that we can maintain that uh, performance and that progress uh, as we go through rather than having that reactive nature and then suddenly having to rifle through the pile to find those right skill sets uh, or those right pieces that we need at the time we need to have that in a planned in a planned manner um, so that the engine actually performs in uh, a very clean and efficient way uh, and we get the best out of it and then the final area which I've joined uh, joined together, the, the two objectives, uh, the final two objectives, are, are linked all around uh, CPD uh, and continual professional development and having uh, a way that uh, we can rec recruit and retain uh, members of staff at the right time uh, and uh, at the right level 
uh, so we know what we're needing and linking to the previous um, objective, but also so that we can engage um, in, a, in, in a coordinated industry-wide um, kind of CPD scheme uh, that recognises the skills that we have, but also um, identifies the appropriate development methods um, within uh, within within the workforce. We've got currently a couple of um, areas that 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 were covered: that Dairy Pro, which you might have come across, or Pig Pro, uh, which are, are ways of, of recording and identifying CPD, and also the work that Tess uh, and the the other side of the biz, the, the biz team do in terms of identifying. Uh, agricultural skills but being able to actually recognize that um, and being able to promote uh, that development of skills is something that we need to work on as an industry uh, to ensure that we get the best out of everyone for you as, as the lecturers you're the starting at that process you're adding value to individuals that want to join into the industry what we need to do as an industry is then maintain that added value to the individual um, and, and the workforce as they progress through their careers so that we've got clear directions of where they're, they're wanting to head um, and what their strengths are and where their weaknesses are and how we can develop uh, and level that out. Uh, and then for a business owner, having that foresight and that insight in terms of what is needed and, and when it's needed um, um, as, we move, as, as, as we move forward. So there's a huge amount of research work that's being undertaken at the moment in these four areas. Um, People management and the softer skills is some, not something that uh, the wider agriculture and horse country injury has, has, has looked into, but it's something that we need to delve into further and further to ensure that we can meet the targets in terms of performance uh, and being more, pro more productive and more pro profitable um, as a sector and also be more planned, like David said, as we move into a very, very um, volatile, changing environment uh, where we won't be supported directly by direct payment schemes and we need to be more more reactive and more um, flexible to change uh, and adapting to, to the environment um, and the changing landscape uh, that we face. So in a nutshell, um, that's, that's very short and sweet, I'm not going to, uh, it's clear, but we need to move towards that, that level balance where people management and the development of the workforce is uh, as equal to the technical ability of the fantastic farmers and growers that we have have uh, in uh, in the UK industry. It's all about those people. It's all about gaining that balance so that we can we can get the best out of the workforce, uh, and then they can lead uh, the development, the performance of the business um, in a well planned manner. And there's a little photo um, where this is the the biz team. Um, uh, when we all could get together just before Christmas last year, when we we're just form working together, uh, which is all good. And now open in to any questions. Thank you very much, Mark. Mark, you've mentioned biz a couple of times, and I've dropped it in. Do you want to um, explain the acronym and, and what we do as a team? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so the biz team or the business insights and skills team uh, was a team that was formed um, in November last year. Uh, which com combines uh, three major elements of, of, of business development, insights in terms of focusing on behaviour change and behaviours that we need to focus on to change um, change activity, and then skills, the skills needs uh, for, for what we need to do. So, yeah, the big focus uh, on business uh, culminates all of the three angles that we looked at in the performance planning um, and and people and offering um, a cross sector offer that is tiered to the level of farmer that that needs it and I think Derek um, with the benchmarking um, and the management of performance element is quite a very clear understanding that we'll have some farmers um, right at the top tier that are benchmarking uh, they're measuring every nth detail within their business and output and they understand where all their costs are going um, and, and, ha and the areas that they need to focus on. Whereas at the other end of the scale, uh, you've got those farmers that haven't necessarily had to focus on, on, on where their, their business is performing, uh, and they've done the same thing uh, for the, over generations and generations like father, mother, uncle, auntie have done previously, um, and, uh, and haven't really got the, the understanding or know where to start to be able to measure that, that that, um, that, that business, it's that tiered approach, so there's an entry point for all um, to get onto the journey um, of, of developing and pushing uh, the business forward. 
Then if we go in, in, into insights, um, this is a big piece of work that's been, um, been rolled out across um, the organization over the last two or three years that in rather than delivering or creating a tool or resource or running a meeting, having a bigger understanding of the farmer and growers um, behavior that needs to be changed to actually uh, achieve the, the, the change that we're wanting. So an example being um, reducing clinical cases of mastitis in a dairy herd. We could just put a meeting on to talk about um, diagnosing of mastitis, uh, identifying um, pathogens and bugs um, and looking at those uh, kind of elements, uh, which are the, the factors that, that cause mastitis within, within dairy cows. However, if the issue is that the herd person is not, say, wearing the gloves or not understanding the difference between an E. coli um, and a Klebsiella mastitis, then we need to change the behaviour within that person to maybe wear gloves um, to reduce the, the contamination factors um, rather than building a resource or a tool uh, to, um, to, to provide some information. So there's a big, big, big piece of work um, and, and, and a lot of, of thought in terms of everything that we offer now. We'll go through um, uh, a couple of well-known models, the CASI model or the RESET model, to identify these behaviours uh, that we need to change um, to, to achieve the outcome that we're, we're, we're wanting to, to achieve. And then finally, skills, which is very much linked to the people element and the piece that I, I deliver here um, and, and head up uh, for AHDB, is, is, is having an understanding of the types of skills that we need to, to add in and develop uh, within the workforce, right from the owners and operators uh, down to the foundation tiers of staff. Uh, and the skills development that are available to, to progress that. Whether that be some formal activity uh, with Tess um, and her side of the team running the Professional Management Development Scheme or the Effective Manager Scheme, which is an accredited ILM uh, Level 3 programme, or to some of the leadership and management training through the AgriLeader programme that I offer across the country, which is completely informal, but still will deliver some of those skills uh, and those, uh, those knowledge gaps. Uh, that, that growers and farmers uh, need to push um, the industry forward. So a new team uh, working cross-function cross, cross function across uh, all of the sectors uh, to, to bring together uh, those business insights and skills um, offer for HDB. Brilliant, thank you Mark. And I think you, you touched on it in your presentation about how people get promoted because of their technical skills rather than their people management skills and, and that can be the downfall of, of many and I think it's quite widely recognised that that's probably one of the reasons we have a recruitment and a, a retention issue in the industry, one of the factors anyway, but do you, how do you see people engaging with this from an industry? Is it something that's gathering pace or is it something that's still quite a hard nut to crack? I would say it's definitely, definitely gathering pace and it's something that we're seeing more and more farmers and growers ask for, um, purely because as UK farmers and growers, we are generally very good at what we do. Um, from a technical point, pr producing food, um, we are generally very, very good at that. Um, where the, the struggle is, is, is that management of people and understanding your teams. And that team could be as small as a family business with maybe one employee or or a couple of family members right up to um, a big corporate business managing hundreds of hundreds of people but there's a real need uh, and a real starting change in that mindset and understanding that that people are at the core um, of businesses and if we can understand people better and understand their drivers understand the areas where we we can develop them um, and understanding their, their strengths uh, we can actually use those to, to benefit the performance, uh, the performance of business. So I think definitely there's an appetite for it. Definitely it's an area that uh, for us at ACB there's a huge focus on moving forward. Um, and I think that 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 will, as, as we start to get the ball rolling, um, that will just hopefully snowball um, in terms of in terms of that, that element. Um, with Brexit coming down down the track in terms of availability of all levels of labour, um, potentially could show some challenges. So pan more important detail um, to to understanding people and that are working within businesses will, will only have a benefit. 
Brilliant. And I think it really, I think your presentation wraps up with with David's as well about that, um, the planning. If, if we haven't got a business plan, we can't have a workforce plan. And if we haven't got a workforce plan, we don't really know what skills we've got. And that doesn't help our recruitment, does it? No, definitely not. They're all so interlinked and so in, entwined. We could put a lovely Venn diagram up that we all like Venn diagrams, but they all overlap and they all interlink uh, within with each other. And um, yeah, all elements are required um, to, to, to pay a bit of focus on um, as we move move into these interesting times. And you, your presentation's focused on the workforce development. That was the brief you were given, so that's good. But moving to new entrants, is there any chance that we could look at a platform um, that would allow new entrants to agriculture to showcase and share their innovations and idea, ideas and possibly any alternative management systems that they're interested in? Yeah, I think it's definitely um, an area that we're focusing on and we're, we're, we're wanting to work with the colleges uh, and universities around the country uh, to ensure that, like I said in my presentation, the, the it's an added value process to a human being that the, the colleges um, and universities will start that process uh, and we need to think about how that 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 lifelong learning and that that continuous development um, happens for an individual that progresses through college and university out into the work based and on their journey um, through through their through their career um, so it's definitely something that we're, we're looking at uh, along behind the scenes and how to best um, best deliver that um, uh, for, for our next generations. Um, I'm very conscious that within um, the further education, higher education sector, just looking at the, the, the topics and the areas that we um, are focused on just from a business element, there's masses and masses of, uh, uh, of, of subject matter to cover, um, which you will only ever be able to dip your toe in very shallow, shallow, shallow and broadly um, that um, we need to we need to build build that journey and build that 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 longevity of learning and development um, as as an individual goes through the workforce. That's brilliant. And Mark, I've put the other two on the spot with what would be the top three asks for college lecturers to to really hammer home to the students and and therefore our workforce of the future. What would your top tips be for from a people perspective? Um, from a people perspective, um, which are the, the first thing I'm going to say, which I'm sure all our lecturers and colleges and universities are doing, is make sure that, that you've got a really good uh, relationship, understanding um, and insight and input from your local farmers and growers. Having understanding of what their challenges are in regards to, to workforce and skills um, and skills required. Likewise, making sure they're aware of the developments that, that you're seeing um, in terms of, uh, of, of, of the techniques of, of ways you're delivering our crumbs. I should imagine the way the, the world of teaching is going now, um, it, like I spend and David and Tess, we all spend our life now on in front of a screen on Zoom or Microsoft Teams, which I'm sure you're delivering huge amounts of your lectures um, through digital manners, which has its downfalls, but also has its positives. So, so making sure that we've got that two-way conversation with your farmers and growers in your surrounding area and that students have access to that and exposure to understand what their potential next employers um, are, are looking for um, in the next employee and likewise for for, for, for a student and um, to be able to showcase what, what their um, new skill sets are which might not be um, widely known by farmers and growers. Take mobile phones for example, I can remember when I was starting out on farm and we had our Nokia 3210 mobile phone my boss was saying, that's a load of old rubbish, that'd be a complete fad. Look where we are, okay, we've moved on uh, 20 odd years, but the, the world is run by an iPhone um, and apps by that. And, and, and that's integration of technology um, and different methods. And just make sure that there's a two way conversation. The second thing I'd probably say is just make sure that these, however you want to brand them, people skills, soft skills, um, are included within curriculum. Um, ensuring students understand about um, themselves, how other people respond to things, how they can develop what an appraisal is, um, how they can instigate a development plan and um, is, only, is only the way that we can professionalise uh, and we can integrate more of these people skills into the norm of running a farming and horticultural, um, uh, horticultural business. Um, 
And my third thing um, regarding people is, 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 is think outside the box. Um, look for those those areas and, and other subjects and other topics. Steal ideas um, from from other industries and, 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 other, and other worlds um, that could be used within developing people within agriculture. I spend my life looking outside of agriculture to deliver into agri into farming and grow businesses. 95% of all the delivery and all the offer that AgriLeader delivers um, to UK farmers and growers is non-farming. Um, is, is, is from the world of education, from the world of industry, from all sorts of, 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 of fields that we try and nick um, good practices and things and, and, and somehow fit them into to what we do. So be creative, look outside the box, um, make sure soft skills and people skills are part of curriculum and, and keep fully engaged with a two-way conversation with your local farmers and growers would be the, the key things from me. Thank you very much, Mark. And so it's now time that I'm going to wrap up um, this session. You still have um, a few minutes if you want to type any last minute questions into the box there. And the speakers are all still here. Um, they might not have their cameras on, but they are still here. So we can still ask them questions. Um, really, it's just left up to me to thank the speakers um, massively. It's really insightful, the information that you've given us today. And hopefully, if you weren't aware of it, um, now you are and you can make use of it. Um, and it would be interesting on your feedback to, to get some kind of sense of what you were and weren't aware of um, so that we know how we can market and, and promote our things in the future. Um, thank you very much for all of your attendance and taking part. I can see that we've had um, very good attention rates all the way through. So I appreciate this is the last session. You've had your three. Um, and hopefully we've given you a good insight of what AHDB is up to and how we plan to support the industry uh, moving forward over the next couple of years, which are obviously going to be quite a tricky time for people. Um, thank you for all your questions. I think we have answered everything that's come in. But again, feel free to get in touch with us afterwards. When the webinar um, shuts down, you will open a browser and you'll get a feedback form. We'll be really grateful if you could fill in that feedback form and let us know what we can do better next time, what you've liked. If there's anything that we can help you with in the future, then please do put it there. If, if you don't tell us, we don't necessarily know about it. So we can only um, respond to what's going on. We will be putting all of these presentations together as a video and, um, and a slide summary. All of those will be um, either made directly available to you through uh, some communication in the next week or via links that are sent to you um, so that you can access that. And I think we've already had feedback from people saying how they're going to use this for their students, which is great. Um, if we can supply that information that helps you teaching better, then that's really, really useful. Um, I think really that is brings it to an end. Um, I'm just going to do a shameless plug for apprenticeships as well. So at AHDB, we do facilitate apprenticeship standards. Um, and I'm conscious that we have flagged areas that we've said, what, what could lecturers do um, put into the curriculum more? I'm conscious you don't have that necessarily that opportunity to change the curriculum but if we work together and, and look at gaps and, and ideas then there is there's, there's routes and ways that we can try and influence the curriculum going forward and if we've got that evidence from you that's working on the front line then that helps us um, not only influence curriculum but also with the trailblazer apprenticeships and if any of you would like to support the development of trailblazers then please do get in touch with us um, Final thank you is the speakers have done a great job, but there's a lot of people that have worked really hard um, to bring all of this together. And Sophie and Carrie have been working behind the scenes, um, pulling everybody together, making sure we were all on time, making sure we had all the right information together. So a really big thank you to Sophie and Carrie for, for keeping us on track and, and making the event as successful as it has been. So hopefully we will all be able to meet in person in the not too distant future. Um, but meanwhile, we will continue to look at how we can share the information with you um, and, and keep you up to date with what's going on at HDB. So if you have any questions, um, Sophie's um, contact details will be on all of the emails and your invites. So please do get in touch and um, we will see you all soon, hopefully. Good luck. Thank you. Bye.